Thanks for joining us today for our webinar this afternoon, our office hours. Um, this is Meg Beyer. I'm part of the MCTAC and CTAC team. I'm going to give folks just a minute or so before we get kicked off with all of our content. So just bear with us another minute or so while we wait for some more folks to join us on the line today, and we'll be back to get started soon. All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's office hours, which is our final offering in our MCTAC and CTAC Business Best Practices and Management webinar series. My name is Meg Beyer and I'm the Assistant Director of Strategic Operations at the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. And I am a member of the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center MCTAC team. I'm really thrilled to be joined by my colleague, Kevin, who is our wonderful WebEx host and will be collecting all of your questions today. And our fabulous presenters, uh, Fern Zagor, David Warznak, and Rose Belfini, who have been sharing their wealth of knowledge and experience throughout this entire webinar series. Um, as I've stated, this is, a, this is our final offering um, in a webinar series. So for those of you who might be interested or want to look back on our previous recordings, please visit the MCTAC website. You can find all of the previous webinars that are associated with this series there. Our goal today, as today is really what we consider an office hours, is going to be to briefly summarize what what we shared in the previous webinars in the series, and then address some of the questions that came in during those different webinars that we were unable to answer on the webinars. And then at the end, we're, we're gonna have some time to take additional questions from you that you might have today. So your questions can come from any of the topics we've covered in this webinar series. We have our wonderful host of presenters and experts who will be able to try and address them. Um, and as you know, I mentioned earlier, my, my colleague Kevin is collecting all of the questions. So hopefully we'll be able to get to all of those questions, but if we don't, we're putting them all in a document and we'll be sure to share with our presenters and figure out a way how to answer them later on. So a few logistics about our webinar before we begin. As we've done in the past, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted along with the brief slides that we have to the MCTAC and CTAC website. Um, we will be taking questions throughout the entirety of the webinar, and we're saving time at the end to address these questions. Um, so please use the chat box functionality that's on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see it. And we're asking that you select, the, on the drop-down. you'll see there's a little arrow. If you select all panelists to chat in your questions, that way all of our 
presenters can see them. Um, but don't worry if not, Kevin is collecting all those questions, so I'll be able to read them to all of the panelists at the end. And with that, I want to thank you again, you know, for joining us all. I know that we are working and living in a in an unprecedented time, and it takes, you know, a certain effort to carve out time for an office hours and webinar. And we appreciate that you're spending time with us this afternoon. Um, and I know our presenters are going to kind of frame what we're reviewing and summarizing in the context of these really uncharted territories and waters that we're kind of navigating at this point. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Fern who will introduce herself and to get us started. Well, thanks, Megan. Thanks, Megan, and hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Um, it's been a real interesting uh, series of webinars that I hope have been helpful. Um, just a few words about me. Some of you know me already. Uh, Fern Zagor, I was the CEO at the Staten Island Mental Health Society, which is really the go-to agency for children and families on Staten Island licensed in mental health, substance abuse, developmental disabilities, and the largest Head Start program um, in Staten Island. Um, I saw the agency through Hurricane Sandy, so that was probably our most recent uh, crisis situation. Um, and I saw the agency through a uh, full merger acquisition. So it's been a, a very interesting ride for me. Um, the merger was completed a year ago, January, and in uh, June, um, I, I left to start my own consulting firm. I figured a uh, mission accomplished and time to move on. Uh, and it was very successful because all the staff had jobs and all the programs remained and the work and continued in the community is still served. So that's in, in, in a nutshell. You see a slide now that says the whole is greater than the sum of, the, of its parts. And I think that that's such an important concept. We tend to uh, put things into silos, into buckets, and not look at how the various components uh, interact with one another, how they relate to one another. And hopefully we'll be able to address that. I think in several ways, all, all of we who have been presenting through this series have been trying to show the interrelationships between program leadership, staff, budget, finances, um, because they don't stand alone. At times we make the mistake of view viewing them alone, um, but it really doesn't work. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But I can't move on without just acknowledging the real difficult, unusual, unprecedented times that we're in, I don't, I don't know what words can describe it properly. Um, none of us have ever seen anything like this before. And it's really required us to be extraordinarily flexible and resilient, which are real strengths, and that's important. Um, we're in uncharted waters, although we've had several weeks now uh, to charter new ways of moving forward. So when you hear what we're presenting now, um, you'll have an opportunity to, to recognize those things that you are already doing. And if it sounds familiar, that's great because then it just reinforces what you already know. Or maybe there's something new. And of course, providing services remotely um, pre presents a whole new array of, of challenges. But I would argue that having a good business plan, good operations, good administrative functions is extremely important even now, maybe especially now, to be able to establish routines. Um, and I also want to point out that um, crisis, the Chinese symbol for crisis is both danger and opportunity. There are a lot of opportunities now for moving ahead, and I've actually heard the state say that they are learning from the benefits of providing services remotely, and we'll be looking, when this is all over, whenever that is, uh, they'll be looking for making some changes in their regulations and guidance that can incorporate some of the good things that we've learned from this process. I think one of the most important things and a takeaway here will be that um, establishing routines, um, getting staff involved, 
and uh, make sure your clients are safe are probably the three most critical areas. And we are going to be talking more about uh, your business routines. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a, a review of what will be taking place today. Um, there are three of us who are presenters. You're going to be hearing from all three of us at various points during this presentation. I'm first because I was the presenter for se session one. Next slide, please. So in, in that session, we talked about the importance of developing a business plan. Now, business practices are a reflection or an agency is really a reflection of its culture and its values. And most of all, it's a reflection of, of the priorities and the leadership style of, of the leaders, of the CEO, the program directors, the board directors. Uh, leaders must generate staff, board, and community stakeholder buy-in. They must align business and strategic plan with business operations and a fundraising plan reflecting the mission and need for sustainability and growth. Uh, extremely, extremely important. Every leader has their own style. Some people like to share everything. Some people like to keep things very close to the vest. I would argue that um, to be effective, regardless of what your style is, effective communication with agency stakeholders is essential. And to remember that the business plan that you develop is an essential tool. It does not stand alone. It's a really a reflection of what your programs, what your mission is, first of all, what programs you decide to offer, and how that interacts with your administrative and your fiscal processes. So that is the overall view of bringing all of those people and those interests together. In, in healthcare, the business plan should align with the triple aim to improve patient experience, improve outcomes, and reduce costs. The strategic plan takes what the business plan has identified and answers how desired results will be achieved. So that's just implementation. What is it that you're really going to do? And then you begin to identify your workflow. And we're suggesting that you use a tracer methodology it's used by JCO, Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation. It's used by OMH when they come in to do their audits. I believe OASS is using the tracing methodology now as well. Um, it's, it is patient focused. It follows the person from the time that they contact the agency and they see what happens to that individual who's contacted you for services and follows every point in that process and it reveals, it's amazing how it works, it just reveals everything. Next slide. Okay, so um, there were a number of questions that were asked that we could not answer uh, when we did the webinar the first time around. So here's one of the questions. I'm looking for suggestions or support to focus on updated business plan and workflow in a rapidly changing and growing organization. So do we have anything? And the answer, which you see here, is that there really are many formats and templates for a business plan. Um, it's not a cookie cutter. Most can be found online. I did my own research and found a whole slew. Some of them, they, you just put information in. They ask you for information, and they'll populate fields. Others, and, and there are business plans that are specific for not-for-profits. Some are for small businesses, large businesses, but there are also those that are specific for the not-for-profit not world. Regardless of the size uh, of your business plan, how many pages it has, um, there are some key elements that have to be incorporated. First is the executive summary. What is this all about? That's the executive summary. The needs assessment. What are we finding? What is, this, what is our agency, what is our plan trying to address? Where are the gaps? Funding and marketing plan. How are we going to raise the money that we need in order to provide the services that we want to provide? And how are we going to get word out about what we're doing? And then, of course, there's the budget. There's the immediate budget, and then there's a the long-term budget. And all of that 
interacts for your overall business plan and the operations. And it's changeable. It's changeable. I should say it's, it's flexible. These are things that you don't want to be changing every day. They, they are a roadmap. They provide you with guidance. But they also have to be real and alive. So if you're finding that um, your plan is no longer on target or you're missing things or you've learned about new issues or like the coronavirus, you know, whoever had a plan for remote services, you had to pivot very quickly. And so now your business planning, your operations have to change very quickly. So it's not static. It has to be a living document. Um, and that makes it most usable. Next question um, that had not been answered before. Uh, I am opening a community space and I'm in the process of creating a nonprofit organization that would be responsible for putting in all of the programming. What would you say is the most important is most important to put in place for nonprofits that are just starting out? Well, some of it we've just talked about. I think all the things that I've said are extremely important. First of all, establish, be clear about your mission, vision, and your culture. You know, what, what's the field of your agency? How are people interacting? How do they interact with one another? And how do they interact with their clients, with their board, with the community at large, with legislators? That creates a culture. And, and you know, you can look, go into one agency and you can feel it. You can feel the difference in culture. Um, so that's first. You identify your leadership team right from the get-go. A leader can't be alone, should not be isolated. You need supports, whether it's a, a deputy leader, you know, deputy executive director of the equivalent or some other program staff or, or others that you're bringing in to help you. Um, you, you're not doing this alone and you're establishing a team and you're setting up lines of communication between your members. And these lines are not just a suggestion. These are the things that make your organization work. So you establish routines, supervision, oversight, reporting expectations, et cetera. And you determine the data you will need to move the organization forward and identify how that data will be collected. I can't emphasize this enough, and I know David's going to talk a little bit about that as, as we move forward. But when you're starting, think about what data you're going to need to help you make decisions. Do that at the get-go. You can always add, you can always take away, but you have to start someplace. And you want to identify your milestones. How do you know whether you're effective or not, that you're doing a good job, that what you're doing, that your plan is successful? So with the data, you're, you are identifying milestones as well as gaps. Next. So this is, uh, thank you, Fern. It was, uh, okay. it was, yes, it was very helpful. Thank you. Well, my name is David Worsnick. I'm a Senior Director for Financial Performance Improvement at CCSI. Uh, folks are not aware of CCSI. We're uh, a uh, technical assistance and uh, business management support organization in upstate New York, um, out of Rochester. Before I came to um, CCSI, I was a um, chief financial officer for Spectrum Health and Human Services, which is a behavioral health organization in western New York. Uh, spent the last um, maybe 10 years of my career really working more in the area of data, data analytics, uh, data manipulation and reporting, looking to integrate financial data with uh, business operational data and clinical workflow and clinic process data. So I was asked to talk a little bit um, in, in the second uh, session about information technology and data. And one of the important points, I think, and I think sometimes we fail to, under, to really think about this, and that, so we need to treat our data as an asset. I mean, from a financial standpoint, um, you know, that, that it's, it is of extreme importance and power to your agency to understand, to be able to collect data, to be able to house it, to be able to then bring it back out to help you inform decisions. So it's an essential part of your competitive advantage and your strategic success. You know, Fern talked about how do you know 
when you're effective? How do you know when you're reaching your benchmark standard? How do you know when you're meeting your business plan or your strategic plan? How do you know how well you're doing against your budget? Um, and it, it's and how do you use that data to articulate your value? And how do you do, use that data to articulate strategically how different you are from others and where that puts you in the marketplace? So it's an it's an asset that that allows you to to provide your services in an informed uh, way to make good decisions uh, that are that are appropriate. So we talked a little bit about information technology. What you know, what really is information technology? It's it's how you collect data, store it, retrieve it, manipulate it, and of course, the right hardware and software are critical. And when we think about data, sometimes we just sort of think about our electronic health record. But I bundled all of our data management. Um, our HR data, our accounting data. Um, maybe we're in an organization that has care coordination or care coordination data. Um, we collect through our Norma business, we collect a tremendous amount of data just through the activity that we do. Having the hardware, software, and training in place to be able to pull that data out, to be able to take that millions, in some cases, millions and millions of transactions and put them into an understandable format uh, that is intuitive and helps us drive decisions is, is, is a critical aspect of information technology. And, you know, when we think about technology data, it's not cheap. Um, maintaining data is not inexpensive, buying technology necessary, training up your staff, finding good train, you know, a good healthcare uh, analysis is, an, analyst is not an inexpensive position in your organization. That doesn't create uh, revenue, but if you think about data as an asset, uh, applying the right tools and the right skills is, a, is an important piece. And your data, it's really, you know, Fern talked about missions, goals, uh, objectives. Your data has to be uh, tied to your mission and goals. And it's part of understanding and, and reinforcing and guiding your business and strategic plans. You have a business plan, you have benchmarks, you have a strategic plan, you have benchmarks you need to monitor, and then you need to pivot if you get off, off course. One of the things that the data does demonstrate to you is, are we being successful? And then we'll, I'll talk a little bit later about quality improvement. Then you implement your quality improvement program to figure out what, what's going wrong, how you can change it, and then how you can continue to measure your progress. And understanding managing data effectively. You know, it, you know, it needs to be organized. Your data needs to be consistent. It needs to be accurate uh, in order for it to help you with better decisions. And your data can increase effect efficiency, certainly, your quality, uh, the value, and help you evaluate performance. And we talk a lot about it and how do you, you, you know, you need to create a data-informed organization. Um, you know, does, does the question always come up? What data do you have to, to inform this decision? What data did you use to make a, a recommendation you may be making. So that's sort of the, the I think, what the fundamental pieces were that I try to, um, to sort of address in that, in that information technology and data. So let's mm, take a look at a couple of the questions that uh, we weren't able to answer on the, uh, the original presentation. So um, the first one is for key performance indicators, how long do you wait to change something that's not working in the program? I thought that was an absolute excellent question, and I'm because I think for me that that's where the art is. So how do you? So the first thing I think about is, in order to make decisions, you need to have a um, you need to have some fundamental pieces in place, and that's timely and accurate monthly data, uh, and you want to monitor your data in a display or a methodology 
that allows you to understand data trends. To me, understanding trends in data is absolutely critical. And so, so, so the first question I have, so you, you, you put your infrastructure in place, you're monitoring your data at least monthly. Some, sometimes you have to monitor that data weekly, but in most cases, monthly is enough. Then the first question is when we're not meeting our goal, and what I always have, did we train staff? Did we communicate well? Do we know that the process that we changed based upon this key performance indicator that we put in place well? You're, you can make a critical mistake if you're making decisions about a process that's not working if you didn't implement the process properly, if you didn't give people the tools if you didn't train them properly, if you didn't articulate what your expectations were for them clearly and evaluate them against those, then you could be making the wrong decisions. You could have a perfectly good process that is not resulting in what you want it to be because it's a process problem of implementation, not the solution that you created. So once you answer that question and say, yes, absolutely, we trained everybody, they've got their tools, we articulated it clearly, we're evaluating them, now what? So the next question I have is, what's the trend? So if you're seeing it's trending down for two consecutive months, um, it could be three, it could be one, it really depends on how critical the KPI is that you're evaluating, how 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 quickly you need uh, to be able to turn around some kind of issue that you're trying to address. But I think a downward trend for a couple months should really start uh, lead you to go in and say, okay, what's wrong? We know that we've implemented well. We know we have the tools. We know we have the train. What's the root cause here? Why are not we are not getting uh, the performance that we expect? Now, if the trend line's flat, so if it's going down, you've got to address it. You have to address it really pretty aggressively. If it's flat, you know, maybe what you put in is not as responsive as you would like it to be, but it's hard to know whether it's right, it's going in, it's going to go in the right direction or the wrong direction. Sometimes you just have to give it a little bit more time. You have to continue monitoring the process. You've got to hold out and wait. And if your trend line is moving up, and you're getting positive results, congratulations. You're making the progress that you want to. It may not be as quickly as you want to make it or maybe more quickly, but you're moving in the right direction. But there is a caveat here that I, even if you've got downward trends, you have to ask a couple questions. Am I looking at seasonal variations? Is it the middle of the summer? We see fewer kids in the middle of the summer, maybe. Um, or. Um, was there fewer program days in that month? So our volume went down in February. Well, we only had 18 program days in February. Um, and if the answer is uh, that, yes, we're, we're looking at some kind of external force that is um, coming to bear on what we're trying to monitor, then you have to wait a little bit longer. So I hope that that answers it. I think that's an excellent question, and, and it's something that every change team has to answer. And um, like I said, there's a bit more of an art and the science, but you have to you have to know that you did it well, and then you have to um, uh, take a look at external forces that may be at play. Uh, next slide, please. So these are a couple of real simple ones. Will Oasis providers have access to Psyches? Uh, this is right from the Psyches website. Um, if you're not familiar with Psyches or you have questions about it, the simplest thing is just bring your browser up and search on Psyches New York and it'll take you to the site. And there's a wealth of information on that site. There's planning documents and guidance documents and there's everything. And you will see the answer to that is yes because the, and uh, OASIS providers currently do have, um, if you have an OASIS license program, you do have access to Psyches. Um, and that's sort of, so this, to the next question, what are the requirements for accessing Psyches? I work as a care manager dealing with Medicaid clients. So Psyches, as you see, the Office of Mental Health manages and grants Psyches access. 
but Psyche's access is, is provided at an organizational level. So if you think that Psyche's data is going to be helpful for you in your work, um, then, and your organization is not granted access, then you need to go to individuals who would be responsible for doing that. Uh, the organization is provided access, and then you as a particular user would be provided access through your organization. They have a pretty, pretty comprehensive security structure. There's a SIP of data, um, and, uh, but you'll need to talk with your organization about getting you access. Um, and those were, the, those were the three questions I had. So um, I think that um, Rose is up next. So if you'd like to switch the slides. Hi, everyone. This is Ro Belfini. I am the former uh, chief, op, uh, chief Administrative Officer of Staten Island Mental Health. I did review with you um, the bill, finance and billing um, webinar. Some of the things I've reviewed was the significance of financial planning and its connection to your business and, and strategic plans. You cannot have a strategic plan without a, a plan, financial plan that's associated with it. You need to communicate that to every, all the key players. We reviewed budget process and why management and staff should be involved. Um, the budget process cannot be done in a vacuum. It needs to be done and, ex and explained to the program managers and their staff so that they know what they're getting involved with and they have ownership to their budget. We talked about unit costs and how that can be used as a benchmark to determine your profitability. Um, and this is really stressed throughout all the state agencies. They all, all want unit costs. If you've ever done a CFR, if you look at a CFR, that's what the CFR is actually doing, com coming up with the unit costs to provide those services for the agency. Um, we reviewed all the components of a revenue cycle, and every revenue cycle could be different for e each organization, but each one does have a revenue cycle, and that cycle can, can is at the point where the client first comes in and how you're getting paid. Those components are important to how you're getting paid. So you need to check insurance, you need to make sure that the billing is done correctly, and these are the things that are all part of the revenue cycle. You need to manage your accounts receivable as well. Uh, we also talked about uh, key performance indicators and how they demonstrate um, your object your organization meet your organizational objectives. Um, and those can change as, as David was saying. If, if your key performance indicators are not uh, what you feel they should be, they can change and but that takes time to do. Don't immediately do it. you need to review. You need to discuss it with the staff themselves. Why aren't you meeting these these uh, indicators? Is there something that's blocking you? Do we need to make a change in your in the process in order to meet those key performance indicators? Um, communicating that and training them and, and seeing where the problem lies, why you're not meeting that, that indicator. Uh, we talked about accounting systems and accounting functions, um, the importance of the general ledger, importance of, of financial reporting, and again, the overall importance of communicating to managers and staff about financial matters and, and so that they have, they're invested into, in, in the program and into your plans and mission. Next slide, Pete, please. Okay, so one of the questions I received, I'm trying to put together a simple cash calendar that gives us a very brief visual on the revenue source and the turnaround time for payment. Is there a tool or template that we can use as a guide in creating this one? Most of the general ledger systems should have something that will give you a, a, a template of what, when revenues are coming in and when you're getting paid. But in addition to that, you can, as long as you're using that general ledger system correctly, if you were to download the, the transactions that you see um, cash receipts, in cash disbursements, you can create or build your own um, cash flow analysis. And also, depending on the history that you see in that cash flow, you can actually do, do project projections as well. Um, 
The next question was, our agency start, just starting, is there any other outside resources that could come in and help? There are multiple um, consulting firms that can help. Um, you also have a great resource in your board so that you can ask your board who have financial backgrounds or, or other backgrounds that will help. You need to use all this information and all, all the key players to, to help you through this process. Next slide. So this is David again. Um, and in the last session, we addressed three, um, three areas that I think could have had their own uh, webinar. They're, they're pretty broad topics, but really tried to um, distill them down into uh, smaller bits. So in that, we, if you remember, we talked about quality, we talked about documentation, and we talked a little bit about compliance. And here what I tried to do is bring out what I think was probably the most important um, sort of overarching or high level uh, thinking that we can do around some of these, um, some of these issues because in any of these quality, quality improvement, documentation, corporate compliance, there are huge structures that can be put in place. There's many different people involved in processes and workflows. But where I started out on that presentation is, you know, we talk about quality all the time of behavioral health. And as I started putting together my presentation, um, and I, I like to work from a context, and sometimes the context is a definition. And I looked at different definitions, and, and the one that resonated with me as a, what, what a definition of quality in behavioral health is doing the right things for the right individual at the right time and in the right way to achieve the best possible results. I do think that that sort of says it all, and it speaks to a number of, of different aspects of the work that we do and, and um, in terms of access, in terms of the expertise of our staff, in terms of best practices, in terms of understanding and measuring outcomes, doing utilization review and, and, and quality review, and making sure that, in fact, you are achieving the best results. And you're really client-centric, uh, you, and you understand, and at the end of the day, that you're returning value, returning value to the individuals that you work with, their families, and the community. And there's the whole area of quality improvement. I went through the whole sort of sort of the steps that you may want to put in place in quality improvement. But really, at the end of the day, it's making changes that will lead you to better client outcomes and better agency and system performance. But as we've, we've all been mentioning, you, you know, you don't need to know what your key performance indicators are. What is your definition of performance? What are the most important pieces? Um, what are the workflows that you have in place to be successful in these areas? How do you monitor your success? And then how do you improve upon them if you're not doing, doing well? Um, how do you determine what the problem is? How do you do a root cause analysis? What team, what people should be at the table? Um, there's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical process that I think, unfortunately, we talk a lot about, um, but I'm not sure we implement it as systematically and as robustly as we can. Um, and the other piece that I talked about is the uh, documentation, effective documentation. You know, it's clear, it's timely, it's well organized, and particularly with uh, documenting with your clients that it demonstrates the continuity of care. care. Now there's all other kind of documentation that goes on, documentation in finance, there's documentation in HR, there's documentation in quality improvement, um, but I think that, and we're all at risk for poor documentation. We're at financial risk for poor documentation. We're at regulatory and legal risk for poor documentation inside of HR. So effective, clear, timely, well-organized uh, documentation across all domains in your organization is absolutely critical. 
Um, and I think that in thinking about documentation under our current environment, one of the things is we have relaxed regulations. Uh, New York State and the federal government, I think, is doing everything that they possibly can to allow and make sure that we can continue to provide care to the community and to the individuals we serve um, and, and have enough resources to be able to uh, support that. But at the end of the day is, is that some people are going to game the system. I mean, it's identical. They always do. And I think that there is going to be uh, an, a possibility of relatively rigorous audits uh, that are going to come after the fact. So assuring that you document your services well. What was the platform used? Was it telephonic? Was it telehealth? Um, and you know, do you need a CR code on that? Do you, you're, are you putting the proper um, service delivery platform code in there? Um, you know, so that level of documentation and, and the work that you're doing and how you're doing it and how you're billing for it uh, is, I think, it's, it is, has always been important, um, but I think it's, it's critically important now. And the fast, last thing we talked about is corporate compliance, which is a whole other issue in and of itself. But, you know, I think a good, a good corporate compliance program really demonstrates, a com if you're doing it right, I mean, you can do corporate compliance to meet regulations, or you can do corporate compliance because you think it's important. And it's not just for risk mitigation, but it's an important part of your business plan. And if it's done well, it re you demonstrate a commitment to doing business in the right way. It's part of the mission. It's part of your vision. We're going to do this the correct way. We're going to follow the rules. We're going to use our funds and assets wisely. We're going to monitor to make sure that we're doing that. We're going to report when we're not doing it correctly. Uh, and we're going to change once a problem is identified. So that's really, I think, that you know sometimes you know, we think about corporate compliance as busy work. I think it's really a, it's a statement. It's a statement that your organization is, if you take it seriously and do it correct, and it's a positive statement. And it's a statement to your staff, to your board, to your clients, and to the community. Um, so let's take a look at a couple questions that we weren't able to answer on our first go around. You see, <laughs> I had a tendency to make long responses because they were excellent questions that you just can't a answer really quickly. So who should be assigned to conduct internal audits of a program's finances to ensure regulatory compliance and how often should they be completed? Well, I can, I can tell you the approach that I took as a CFO for many years and the other people, people have oversight and regular audit against their, against their finance. What I tended to do is really take a look at absolutely crafting a, a well-crafted fiscal policy and procedure manual. But not just a manual. A manual has to clearly delineate roles and responsibilities. And they're fashioned to, in part, in a, in a large part, ensure that you have solid internal controls in place. Um, and a good internal control structure followed 100% of the time uh, will in many cases ensure regulatory compliance and mitigate any financial risk that you have. But it's important that you evaluate the process. So you, you know, any process is, is worker or staff dependent. So I always thought I have a clear set of guidelines. I communicate those guidelines well. I communicate those expectations to my staff. I have proper controls in place, and then I evaluate against the policy and procedure. How many times do we run into a problem, and you go back and you ask your staff, well, well, how did this happen? Well, you know, we used to do it this way, but then they stopped doing it, and I didn't think it was that important, and so I, you know, I made it up as I went along. Well, that's when you get into problem. So you have this, you have this structure, it's clearly articulated, roles are articulated, and you evaluate performance against it. And then, of course, your independent auditors have an important role to play. Uh, they normally will be coming in every year. They're hired by the board. They report directly to the board. That's another layer of, of, of protection. 
uh, they have very rigid standards that, that guides their works and their opinions. So I always thought if I had all of these pieces in place, is that I could, I could reason, I could really mitigate um, my risk. So let's go to the next question. So we save a little bit of time left for the end here. Kevin, could you switch the slide, please? Thank you. Compliance review. So here, what do I view, think about compliance reviewing notes from DSPs? Uh, and is that overstepping the audit team's role if the focus is to ensure it's complete and tied to problem? I, you know, each individual has their own set of, of structures. Is it overstepping? I can't answer that question, but what I can tell you is I think there's probably three types of audit that you should be carrying out against these notes. Some are billing. You know, do the notes match uh, the standards necessary for billing? Does the detail in the note match the information on the bill? They'll be submitted. Uh, will this? Will the somebody coming in and reviewing the note and the bill? Will that stand up to audit? This clinical component of that are the goals appropriate? Do the interventions match the goals? Are the notes well written? Do they conform to agency standards? Do the notes reflect progress? And then the third piece is utilization. Do the notes in total reflect the level of care that's appropriate for the individual served? So you need to have these three pieces in place. It's then an organizational decision of who does what. And if you're in a position, if you think there's a gap, there's a gap in what needs to be looking at, well, then that's, that's an organizational conversation that has to go on uh, because each of these are a critical aspect of, of assuring uh, quality care uh, regulatory uh, um, regulatory compliance and good utilization practices. So I think that that moves us, Meg, to see if there's been any additional questions that have come up during the conversation. Thank you, David, and thank you, Ro, and thank you, Fern. Um, we did get one question so far, so. As we're, I'll, I'll read this, but as we're waiting and do have time, I want to encourage anyone who might have additional questions to please feel free to chat them in. But in the meantime, let me dive into the question we did receive. So our question, this is related to documentation. Um, and the participant is wondering what the presenter's thoughts are regarding using forms that have separate boxes for all of the required elements to be noted for for given services versus using blank progress notes and relying on staff to remember to include all the required pieces. So I think they're asking yeah. for your opinion on what the best would be. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I can tell you what we did in our organization, yes. <laughs> and, and, and we we had progress note templates. Um, and whether they're check boxes or drop downs or how it, it really depends on the configuration of your system um, because we wanted to make sure that all the key aspects of, of what needed to be documented were documented. We didn't want to have somebody forget. You don't want to go back to notes. You don't want your, your compliance auditors to be constantly going back to people. We had a so we had a formatted uh, uh, progress note template. But the trick in that is to assure that you uh, train your staff to, to not just do cookie cutter con uh, a content. Um, because you, you can get into this thinking, and I check this, check this, check this, and you know, I'm done. Well, you really have to individualize. You have to, you have to bring forward the nuances of the intervention. You have to, you know, bring forward what the client is saying and, and speak in, in part in their voice in that note. It needs to show consistency and progress over time. So um, uh, we always thought that it was important to keep people on track, but then we did a lot of training about how you really then make sure that you individualize this note. Because auditors at the end of the day, if they come in and they just sign these, find these cookie cutter check off things, you know, they begin asking questions about really, truly, what 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 happened during that intervention. So, um, my my the way we did it is we kept people on track and made sure we had report in the progress note what we needed, but then made sure as part of our 
compliance and supervisory reviews that those notes fully reflected the, the work that was going on in each of those interventions. So I, I'd, like to, I'd like to add to that. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I 1,000% agree with David, um, not surprisingly. Uh, we developed templates for our progress notes, and it's important that uh, different programs had different templates because the requirements are not always the same. And, we, and in that way, that was one of the ways that we were able to individualize the progress notes by making them specific to the program and to the program requirements. Um, but we, we made sure that every field that would be, that would be looked at uh, through an audit was completed appropriately in the, pro, the progress notes. So there would be a, a section for each one, what goal was being, uh, was being addressed during the session, who was there, and what was the length of time, um, uh, you know, all, all of those pieces, but then a very large empty area that can allow for uh, a more uh, personalized kind of progress note that would be reflective of what took place, whether it's an individual, a family, or a group. I, I also wanted to add two other things to what um, David had been referring to. One is, um, Again, you talked about uh, uh, the importance of, of an internal auditor. We had our own, and, and frankly, this came after a very um, concerning uh, OMIC audit where we found that um, some of our billing was not as consistent as it should be, that there would be notes, that, uh, that there would be um, claims submitted and didn't have the corresponding notes or didn't have timely notes. Uh, that, that was one of the biggest problems. Um, others would be uh, uh, um, not th that a, uh, a goal was not adequately um, identified that was being addressed during the session, or the treatment plans were not uh, reflecting the work that was being done during the session. So those were the sorts of things. So we hired our own internal auditor and trained her as if she were an external auditor. To, to take a, a sample of all of our charts and go through them for every program. And then we could identify trends, problems, strengths, areas of training that were needed. And one of the things that we found, now it goes to documentation, is that um, an interesting tool, subject for a whole other training or, or um, webinar, is the use of collaborative or concurrent documentation. Um, it's, it's a tool that helps with time frames, especially when there's uh, pressure around productivity and, and um, seeing a lot of people. But in truth, it's a very good clinical tool to engage clients effectively. I hadn't understood that before I went in for that kind of training. Um, as a clinical tool, you can engage the individual or the family or the group around what it is that you're hearing and understanding from your clients and what's being reflected in the charts. They all know you're keeping the charts. And now they, you're empowering them to have some input into what's being said. And you can use that. Maybe they're saying that you didn't understand them correctly. You know, if you're reflecting back what, what you've experienced, or what you heard them saying, you're going to write that down in your note, and you're saying, this is what I'm writing, this is what I understood you to say. And they'll say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. It gives an opportunity for more engagement. And again, it's a whole other webinar, but it thinks about documentation not as just a, um, a bureaucratic process that you need to go through to meet all of the requirements and stand up to audits. It's actually, a, a can be used as a very good tool. And the last thing I'll say about, about that is that um, under uh, COVID now, uh, and, and FEMA dollars and other grants, um, although regulations have been lessened um, for these grants, the documentation has to be very precise and it's very demanding and you have to have business structures set up so that you could collect all the information that's going to be needed to, um, to justify the dollars that you're getting through these grants. So documentation and, and structures, business structures, all the things that we were talking about are always important but extremely important now. And although the, um, the requirements, requirements are being lessened, 
Um, quality care is not. Client con confidentiality, although we don't have to follow all the HIPAA regulations, but still protecting client con confidentiality and providing good quality care is still our standard of care, and that has not been reduced. Yet that has to be reflected in documentation. You triggered off a lot of additional thinking on my part, David, by, by what you were saying. <laughs> Well, we also right. triggered some other questions actually related to documentation, so which is great. Um, so if, if you don't mind, I might just ask the next one and see you know what your what both of your thoughts are. And Rose, if you're if you have thoughts as well, I welcome you to add them. Um, so another documentation question. Someone is wondering if it's recommended that we keep paper documentation. Um, this this organization and agency scans our documents. But the paper documentation they do also keep, and they're taking up a lot of space. So, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I'm, I'll jump in, and then Turner Rose can jump in second. Uh, what we did basically was we scanned our documents and then shredded the original document. Um, and because I had a warehouse of paper that was just becoming unwielding, so it, when we when we switch to electronic, now there are some, if you take a look at regulations, I think in some financial areas, there's probably some source documents that you need to save, but as we did clinical documentation, we were moving to our, a um, uh, electronic, basically, paper trail. I don't know, Fern or Rose, do you have any additional thoughts about that? Um, I'll, I'll say something then, Ro, if, if there's anything to add. A lot of it is a reflection of the kind of electronic health record you have in that system and how much it, it can take in and scanning capability. Um, our um, system and the way we set it up had um, really required us to have both an electronic health record and a paper record. So for instance, we did not go the next step towards scanning everything. And so when we're getting documentations from other agencies or providers, we, we, um, we kept that as, as paper. Uh, the signatures that on treatment plans or, or other documents, we kept as paper. So we, we kept, just out of convenience, a combination. Ultimately, if you have the resources, then scanning everything and having it all part of the medical record it's probably the best practice, but it's not always feasible. Ro, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I, I remember uh, during the transition from, you know, when in the merger process, there was a process in place where we would take our old charts, scan them, have them um, quoted so that we can actually look for them. But that that is a very big, long process and procedure because you need to get those documents um, and you need to have some kind of reference for them so that needs to be kept in, in mind if you're going through that process. That's specifically when you're converting from one system to another and not losing valuable information as you're going from one to the other. So those are things you know, if you've decided that your current system is not adequate or you want something different whatever it might be you have to think through a transition plan. Well, thank you all. Um, I think we are at the end of our time, unfortunately, for our, our webinar today. So I, I want to thank all of our presenters, um, everyone who joined and chatted in your questions. And, you know, thank you for making this, you know, to our presenters, thank you for sharing so much and making this such a rich um, offering, this whole series that started back, I think way back in even February, even perhaps. So it's been really wonderful to, to kind of learn along with you as we go. And to everyone who's joined us, thanks for really enriching this experience and asking those questions. Um, I think it really helped to make this an, an even better um, series um, with all of your questions. So look to the MCTAC and CTAC website. You'll find all of the recordings and slides posted there. And absolutely, we hope to engage with you again. If you have more questions about this topic, please feel free to email mictac.info at nyu.edu. 
and we'll be collecting questions there as well. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.